Legends and Losers is sponsored by Oracle NetSuite to turbocharge your growth. Go to netsuite.com slash legends right now. On today's episode, why marketing fundamentals matter, how marketing over coffee became one of the most popular marketing podcasts on the planet, and why a free range conversation with my old friend John Wall is so much fun. All right, all right, all right. Joey Ramon said, hey, ho, let's go. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Hello, my legendary friends. This is Christopher Lockhead. And am I ever stoked that you're joining us for this episode? Uh, Today, we talk all things marketing with one of the most popular marketing podcasters on the planet, John Wall, the host of Marketing Over Coffee. And um, John and I have actually known each other for a lot longer than either of us would like to admit. (laughs) And uh, you'll hear you'll hear a little bit of our backstory in our conversation. The interesting thing about um, uh, having a conversation with John is not only is he a uh, CMO VP of marketing himself, so he's a longtime technology marketing executive. He hosts one of the most popular marketing podcasts, and so he is incredible view into what it takes to uh, do legendary marketing today. And we really get into that in our conversation. I think you're going to love it. Now, welcome to Legends and Losers. If you're a longtime listener, thank you from the bottom of my uh, whiskey stained heart. And if you're new, uh, stoked to have you. Now, if you're new, I got to warn you, we are not like most shows and we are not for everybody. Most of us have grown up listening to interview shows. And on a traditional interview show, what you get is a professional host, journalist type with a uh, bunch of uh, questions and more than likely a uh, pre-determined narrative that they're trying to drive. And uh, and then what you get is a guest who's typically a super accomplished person who's been media trained and they have their talking points. And what you hear when you listen to the typical TV, radio, and even many podcasts is a collision of talking points and a pre-constructed narrative from the host. And then they edit the shit out of that and they serve up only the pieces that you want to hear. None of that happens on Legends and Losers. Um, And it's a different kind of experience. We are what you could think of as a authentic dialogue show or a conversation show. And so what we do is we try to have a real conversation with somebody. We almost never edit the show or edit it very uh, sparsely, so to speak. And what we're trying to do is capture lightning in a bottle. Can we have an amazing conversation with an amazing person about what it really takes to design a legendary business and a legendary life? And the experience we hope you have is an eavesdropping experience as opposed to uh, consuming a interview show. So that's what Legends and Losers is about. And we're not for everybody. Some people love it. Some people really want their their interview crap hole is served up to them on a plate, and that's not what happens here. Another cool thing about uh, John's podcast, Marketing Over Coffee, is I would assert they are also a conversation or a dialogue show, much more than a traditional interview show, as their name would suggest. And so, uh, uh, you know, he's a great he's a great guest because this is what he does on his show. Now, I was on Marketing Over Coffee a little while ago and had a blast, and John and I met each other, like I said, more years ago than we like to talk about, when he was in, um, uh, at an event company called DCI out of Andover, Massachusetts, and I did a lot of speaking for them, and, and we met, um, as I'm now apt to say, back in the day. Um, and he's gone on to do amazing things. Marketing Over Coffee is over a decade o- old. And, uh, and so we get caught up and we talk about all the cool stuff that's going on in marketing. So today, John J. Wall speaks, writes, and, practice, and uh, practices at the intersection of marketing, sales, and technology. Uh, he co-hosts Marketing Over Coffee with his uh, buddy, Christopher S. Penn. And um, he also is the author of a great book called B2B Marketing Confessions. He's the head of marketing at a software company called Event Hero. And uh, he's one of the most interesting guys in marketing. So without any further ado, here he is on Legends and Losers, my buddy, John Wall. You know, I've, I've been on a bunch of podcasts as a guest. And uh, I was stoked to be on your show. I thought we had a lot of fun. Yeah. And I got to tell you, I have received so many comments and acknowledgments of one sort or another. And, and so, uh, you know, I know your show's popular, but like fucking A, dude, is it popular? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's nuts. I had a thing 
back in the fall where I was down at IDG talking to Josh London, the CMO over there. And he's like, oh yeah, the CMO of Slack told me about your show. And I was just like, holy crap, like all these important people are listening to this. And you know, I don't know, it's, it still just blows my mind that it's, that we get this kind of traction and audience. Yeah. So I, I, I I'm curious, um, remind me how old, uh, marketing over coffee, how old is it? Oh, dude, we are over 10 years now. You know, we're up to. Holy fuck. Yeah. Yeah. It's like episode five, 20 or something. No, I knew you'd been doing it a long time. I didn't realize it was a decade. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's 10 years of stuff, which yeah, blows me away. I can't believe we've been doing it this long, but yeah. Yeah. We, you know, came in when it first dropped and have just kind of continued to stick with it because we both love doing it. Yeah. It, well, it, and it's a great show and you have uh, really good guests and it's very, very clear just having been on the other end of it that, I mean, I don't know how big your audience is, but whatever, whatever it is, is a loyal audience that pays attention because when I was on, you know, I've been on shows that I'm, I'm sure are bigger from an audience perspective. Um, but I would say marketing over copy in the last, you know, year and a, since play bigger came out, um, probably in the top five, uh, in terms of reactions that I could judge, you know what I mean? Yeah. Ref- yeah. References back. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, I got to ask you, I mean, how, how did you build this thing and how is it you make this great podcast? Well, it's, um, so, we, you know, we're up to the point now, it's like 40, 50,000 downloads a month and, you know, that's on usually four episodes. So it's around 10,000 an episode. Um, but the majority of it has just been word of mouth because we've been doing so many years, you know, it's, um, because the, the one thing that is just fantastic is that it's, you know, nobody's listening to the show unless they're doing a lot of marketing and they're well into the tech, you know, it's just, it's yeah. a real niche audience. And so, um, it's, it's just yeah. tech or primarily tech. Well, it didn't mark, we've always said the intersection of marketing and technology. So, um, you know, we're always talking about how to get more out of your marketing with technology. Um, but then, you know, over the years too, it's kind of morphed a little bit. Like it used to be every week was like, okay, here's how we trick Google this week. And as time went by, it was great because as it spun up, I got access to better guests. You know, it's kind of like <clears throat> we got Simon Sinek on and then you get Seth Godin on and Mitch Joel and and Christopher Lockhead, and, you know, you kind of get these people who can talk at, at a bigger scale about more, more strategic stuff. And I think that's just great because now we can kind of cover the whole board. We still have the nuts and bolts stuff, but there's also bigger message to kind of keep you on track and make sure that your career w- is going somewhere. You're not just going to be the, the email campaign dude or whatever. Yeah, it is interesting how you move up and down topics, right? You move from sort of very, uh, from strategery to SEO and, and up and back down again, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely try and cover. It just, you know, it's like, you know, it's just like your show too. It's kind of like if you were to sit down with some people who know what they're doing after work with a couple drinks, you know, what's the kind of stuff you're going to talk about and what are you into? And that's, that's where all the fun is. Yeah, one of my favorite uh, iTunes reviews of our show, um, somebody called it like going to B-school in the back of a dive bar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. You want to get to that stuff that, you know, it's not the sound bites. It's like the the ten minutes and the twenty minutes in stuff where people are giving you the real explanation of how things work or the way to do things better, and that's that's where all the good stuff is. Yeah, very, very cool. So, uh, what do you? Where's your mind at right now, John? Vis a vis marketing. Um, you know, what do you think about as a marketer? Because the, the podcast is volleyball after school for you, is it not? You have like a real job, a job, don't you? Yeah, yeah, have a dig. It. Well, it's, I've got a bunch of stuff going. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, so what are you doing? Yeah, yeah. What do I actually do? So, Event Hero is, you know, could be called the day gig. Um, basically, I'm VP of Marketing Event Hero. We do lead retrieval, session tracking, badging for events. So it's we uh, went in and change the market as far as how lead retrieval runs. You know, it used to be you would go to a show, you would rent these crummy devices like a 10 year old Blackberry or something. And it was all a hassle. And now you just download our app, you scan badges and you go. And so I've been with event hero. We've been about, God, it's going on five years now with this. Um, and so we're still kind of trying to get that off the ground. We have some momentum, but it's been, you know, it's been a fight, but we're, we're alive with that. And then in the background though, you know, for the past 10 years, I've been doing the podcast and over the past three or four years, the podcast has had so much momentum that, you know, that's becoming more and more viable. And I'm actually having to offsource some of the work of that just to keep it, to kind of keep everything going. Um, and how do you and think same, about monetization? 
Uh, you know, for marketing over coffee, it's been advertising revenue right now. That's been yeah. the big thing. Um, and it's interesting because we you have- You guys are not cheap, if I remember. I, I, someone told me they had talked to you about sponsorship and they were surprised how expensive you were and that you guys just sort of said, well, hey, listen, we have an awesome audience and if you want to get access to it, you need to fucking pay up. Or I, You probably said it much more nicely than that. But <laughs> Yeah, no, but that is, yeah, that's the message because, you know, the thing is, you know, a lot of times we get people coming to us, yeah, and they want the, you know, 20 bucks per thousand rate that you're getting on every podcast around the world. Um, but for us, when, you know, a lot of our sponsors view it as lead gen. You know, they're throwing money down and they're going to be able to get 10 leads a month or 15 leads a month. And, you know, they don't care that the total audience is only, you know, seven to 10,000. If they get 10 leads a month and they're, you know, the average lifetime value of their customer is three, four hundred thousand dollars dollars like they're more than happy to throw down 10 or 15,000 a quarter to get access to that because it pays for itself you know just after four or five leads um but yeah i would like to crack through you know and it get, get to a little more mainstream where there's folks advertising just because they want the presence not you know every quarter coming back like oh i only got 25 leads this quarter um but it's yeah it's you know if you're um, you can't get much more focused. I mean, everybody that's come with us and has success has always wanted all the inventory they can get, you know, because it's, yeah. uh, and you limit, about, you limit your number of sponsors, don't you? Yeah. That's been a part of it too. You know, we, cause we, you know, the show's 20 minutes a week. I don't want to go beyond two sponsors. I don't want, you know, 10 of the 20 minutes to be a shilling stuff. Um, and, it, and there's a lot of personal review too. You know, there's a lot of products that we just won't put on the show. Like if there's something that we wouldn't use, it, it won't get on the show. I mean, cause we're kind of, we're given a personal endorsement. Like if we say somebody's worth doing business with, it's because we know they are and they have a good reputation. We're not just going to take every buck that people are willing to throw at us. And I, I got to ask you, um, have any of the advertisers ever tried to fuck with the show or get you to do things you don't want to do or influence the show in any way that, that you weren't stoked about? No, no, but we have, I mean, we've done, uh, we do paid content, you know, I mean, basically the, the process is we say, look, we'll record, a, you know, a couple shows with you and see how it goes. And then we'll tell you if we think that that's stuff that could run on the show. You know, there are people that will sponsor kind of con conditionally, like they won't jump in unless they think that they can get some, some play out of it. So there is, you know, but the editorial comes first. Like if it, the other side of this is like, you know, we're talking about marketing tools all the time. It's not like, you know, we're going to talk about smoking products or something. Pretty much every episode is promoting something. And so, you know, the folks that are willing to support the audience and keep the content flowing, you know, we're more than happy to kind of give them a chance to tell their story and whether or not it's worth sharing, that's a whole nother story. But right. um, yeah, I'm trying to think, uh, you know, I, actually, I haven't done much of that with marketing over coffee. There's another cast that I've been producing for over a year now, the stack and flow which is hardcore marketing and sales automation tools. Like literally we're talking about the tool stack every week on there. And that one we've explored more kind of stuff with G2 crowd and with um, uh, drift and a couple other players of, you know, we'll go to your events. And the other, the other tie in that's great is events. You know, if somebody's throwing an event where they have, you know, 15 or 20 big names coming in, they sponsor us, we go to their event, we can get 10 or 15 shows in one shot. And uh, that's, and you know, they, their event gets promoted as the source of all this stuff. That's a, that's a neat uh, model to yeah. get everybody fun up. So where's your head at? I mean, you have an incredibly interesting seat uh, talking to all these forward leaning marketers and new technologies for marketing and so forth and so on. You have a very interesting seat in the kind of marketing technology world. What are the big things that you're thinking about uh, as it relates to uh, marketing in the future? The, uh, artificial intelligence is like all the buzz right now. I mean, yeah. everybody's got that and it's on fire, <clears throat> but underneath that there is, there is some reality. I think the thing for me is more cleaning up your data and getting everything integrated. You know, the people that can clean up the data and the people that can connect the data to other, other tools and other integrations. And this is nothing, you know, this is the same problems people have been dealing with for the past 20 years, but the bottom line is like all, you can't take advantage of any of that AI stuff unless your, you know, your data stack is clean and you have actionable stuff there. I mean, that kind of AI is being sold to everybody is everything, but the reality is that's for the Olympic level marketers. You know, if you're a CMO that's got your act together and has had it together for a couple of years, then yeah, maybe AI, AI is something you should be looking at. But for everybody else, it's like, dude, get your funnel straight, get your, you know, all your systems working together so you've got the data you need, make sure the sales guys are, you know, have got the lead 
patents that they need and that you're tracking how these deals go. It's just, it's kind of all infrastructure for me this year. So just good old fashioned marketing automation, basics, build your mail list, retargeting, all that good shit. Yeah, there's a lot of that. I think, um, uh, you know, making sure your social presence is good. And I, a big one is service. You know, I think we're kind of, people don't realize that, you know, if you start cutting corners on service, then you're just in that race to the bottom. And, you know, the sad truth now is in tech, the race to the bottom takes about, you know, 15 minutes. So if you're, you know, if you want to create a great company and you want to have great service, like that's where you want to point the marketing and sales automation towards. And I think that, that's the kind of a big sea change is that for so often, a lot of the sales and marketing automation was kind of dumped towards lead, get, lead gen and new customer acquisition. Whereas I think people need to be doing a lot more as far as retaining existing customers and upselling and make sure that people are happy, you know, because that, that's more profitable business than the, the lead gen too. Interesting. Uh, and so if I'm a CMO today, um, you know, what are the top three things I should be thinking about to, uh, to be successful? Yeah, for the CMO, you know, it's an, it's an interesting game because you really, you know, you've got like, I mean, little 19 different channels. I mean, there's all these different channels you could go down to, to make sure that you've got stuff straight. I think, uh, you know, social and display ads like, you know, Facebook and YouTube ads are an area where, you can do a lot of stuff now to make sure you're spending a lot less than you've ever spent before. You know, it used to be that you just kind of had to buy in bulk and get out there. And now you can target stuff so much better. And that is one area where big data helps out too. If you can take advantage of some of these data services, stuff like stack adapt, where you can, you know, really target and not just be paying for every single page view, but be, you know, paying only for people that have been to your site within the past month and have, you know, mentioned something on social channels that they're looking into you can just see huge gains there. You know, instead of spending millions, you could spend, you know, single digit thousands and get better traffic. So that, that's a huge opportunity one, for the One of the things on, you know, there's so much interesting shit going on with video. Um, one of the interesting trends I've seen is particularly for younger people, if they want, if, they, if they're looking for how to stuff, they don't Google it. They go to YouTube and they type in how to X, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's, you know, self Google learning. Now let me take that back using YouTube for learning and yeah, just searching on the video, like not even skipping Google entirely and going straight to YouTube. That's, uh, that's definitely the way people want to do it. And it's, it's interesting, you know, you see a lot of people get the upsell right there where that's, you know, they kind of show you how to do it. And then at the same time, it's like, well, if you need the parts, come see us here. And if you don't want to go down this path, you know, if we've managed to scare you away effectively with this video, you know, come talk to us there. So, yeah, that, that's like one of the gems in content marketing too. You know, I think a lot of people kind of saying that we've, we're in this content marketing hangover where people, you know, content marketing was everything for a couple of years, but that's one area where, you know, relevant videos and, and that's the key to it. It's like the content has to be relevant. So many people have made stuff that's, you see this stuff that's not relevant to their business. Like, yeah, it's great content. It gets shared all over. You get all these views and likes, but you're not driving any business, you know? So it's kind well, of- Well, here's a simple one that blows me away. I never would have guessed the massive explosion in um, YouTube reviews of products and specifically the quote unquote unboxing, right? <laughs> so like, you know, you think about our world of podcasting, if you want to uh, upgrade your microphone and you're thinking about maybe some new microphones, right? And you, you, you narrow it down to three new microphones that for whatever reason you think might be cool for marketing over coffee. And, and so if you Google that shit or you YouTube that shit, there's going to be some dude in Britain or India or fucking Kuala Lala Ding Dong or I don't know where who's got an unboxing video of this thing. And, and, they, and they show you, know, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? Oh, dude, kids' toys. It's insane. There's this lady who gets, you know, 250 million views of her open up these $6 kids' toys. And it's just not so, you know, you look at the math and the millions she's got, she's making high six figures, you know, just by sitting there opening up toys. It's insane. And, and so one of the things that I suggest to marketers all the time is, okay, well, if these are the kinds of videos that are getting a lot of attention, why are you leaving it up to somebody in Kuala Lala Ding Dong to maybe do it? To do maybe, your unboxing video. Right. Yeah. Why wouldn't you do your own unboxing video, particularly for a consumer product? And I, and I actually think 
for enterprise B2B brands, you know, you could have a fun, if I was still a CMO, we would have a fun video of the unboxing of our enterprise software, you know, cloud <laughs> carbodingulator, yeah. right? It, it, there would be a fun video about that for sure. And so, I, I don't know, I, I just find it interesting that um, these product review videos are so popular on almost any kind of category you can think of. And so few of them are actually produced by the company that creates the product. Yeah, right, right. The, the one doing it. The other thing with video like that too, is people make the mistake of like betting everything on their one video this quarter. And the successful stuff that I've seen are teams that they're like, okay, we're going to crank out 30 videos over the next six months. And it's just ridiculous. Like they'll do that. And sometimes they'll all die, but then like a year and a half later, one of them will pop and they'll get like a million views and it's, you know, and the stuff's all still relevant. So it's good, but you're kind of like seeding it. And I don't know, I guess it's like farming, like just throwing some random seeds out in the field and see what shows up six months later. You know, it's funny that you say that because um, whether it was the book marketing for play bigger or the marketing we do for legends and losers, you know, I thought like this shit was figured out. And that you could hire like, make your book an awesome bestseller, consultantsrus.com. And you could, you could hire, make our podcast a top, you know, 50 podcast in the world, consultantsrus.com. And there was like a playbook for this. And there really isn't. Yeah, no. That, and, you know, again, that's like right back to the AI thing too of like, there's just, there's no data on this. There's no answers as far as like, okay, if I throw that out there, how's that going to be received? Like the only way to do it is throw it out there and just see what happens. And that's, you know, that's like right at the core of legends and losers too. It's like, you just, you have to go out and give your best shot and pour as much stuff out there as you want. And there's really no rhyme or reason as to what's going to pop and what's going to stick. At least that's what we found. It's sort of, it's, there's a little bit of a dichotomy on one hand, you know, um, what gets very clear if you're in any kind of a digital marketing world is, you know what? Mail list, mail list, mail list, right? Get, develop your mail list. And I, I remember when I heard that, when, it was, when I was first starting to do some reading and thinking about what to do for the marketing of, of, of Play Bigger, I was like, well, really? It's, it's about oh, yeah. direct email marketing? Like, we're, we're, it, it's no different than it was back in the DCI days. It's just digital now. Right. Yeah. No, that's, that's for us too. The, the newsletter, that's the biggest driver. Every time I drop that newsletter, there's going to be links to the sponsors, you know, because the, the, when they're listening to the podcast, they're driving, they're exercising, they're doing, you know, they're not near a keyboard. They can't do anything. So it's, man, you push that email though. And, oh yeah, those are the links I want. And they'll drill through to the content and to the sponsors too. Well, and I know this sounds trite and, and stupid, um, but it's been a fascinating education for me because, um, if people love your email, then they really love your email. Like it's, it's, it's the furthest thing from spam. Right. And, uh, the funniest thing is, is the number of people that have told us that they are subscribers to the show on iTunes or wherever they get their, their, their shit. And, and they've subscribed to our newsletter, which really is just telling you what shows are up right now. Right. I mean, we're not, we're not doing anything. You know, Legends and Losers isn't a business, so you know. It, but we do blast out a Mailchimp that says, "By the way, here are two new shows." Right, and and even though it's that sort of simple, people tell us they love getting our emails. Yeah, no, no, they're all into it. You know, that's a yeah, I get the DC Comics email comes in for me, dude. I, I just read that every day. It's like I just want to see what's the art look like, what's going on there. You know, and it's yeah, it's it's funny you bring up spam. It's like totally the anti-spam. It's like you you're disappointed if it doesn't show up, you know, because right. you want it, the great stuff because it's so targeted to you. So on one hand, there's this old school direct marketing email world that is, that is as relevant and maybe more relevant than ever. And yet at the same time, there's this, this, there's this, all this crazy experiment shit that we've been talking about. Right. And it's like, I'll give you one. I don't know if you found this. So um, I, I was beginning to think that, maybe we should stop tweeting that uh, a buddy of mine, Adam Honig, uh, who's the founder of Spiro, uh, he says, you know, Twitter is like screaming in a, in a dance club, right? It's just there, but it don't, 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 and everybody's screaming and yelling. And so you scream and yell while everyone else is screaming and yelling. And uh, this is just don't, don't, don't. And so I thought, ah, fuck it. Let's turn our Twitter off. Um, 
anyway, I did that for a while and it didn't really see much change in, in downloads or any of that. And then decided to go mental on Twitter. And so um, we now tweet from my account and the Legends and Losers account like fucking 30 times a day. Just And, yeah, and guess yeah. what? Uh, half our traffic on legendsandlosers.com comes from social, a little less than half, about 40 something, high 40%. And of, of, of our traffic, half of it now is fucking Twitter. Yeah, yeah, it's social fire. Yeah. Well, and have you guys and done so that? So I just didn't, I didn't realize that, you know, even though I think Adam's right, it is screaming in a nightclub. So fuck scream. 30 times a day and, and people go to your website <laughs> and it, it happened. Well, that, and then the, the paid side of that too, you know, if you upload your own list there and target those, you know, it's, it's just ridiculous. You can pay like 20 bucks and you'll get all kinds of crazy engagement. That's interesting. We really haven't spent money on Twitter. We did a little bit of it with the book and we just didn't know we were doing it. So that didn't yield anything. Uh, for legends and losers, what we did was we hired this 27 year old, genius growth hacker named Nick Cullen. And he's got all these nefarious things that he likes to do. <laughs> right, right. Um, and so it's been fascinating. Uh, and we've started with a heavy focus on, on uh, Facebook and, um, and we're now doing, starting to do more on LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, but so, yeah, I guess the point is for me with my CMO hat on, there's sort of half of this, which is just good direct marketing, blocking and tacking bullshit, build your email list. But the other half of it to, to the point I think you're on, John, is, hey, all these platforms, all these bots, uh, you know, Jamie J telling me about these cooies, conversational user interface, right? So we know bots that we talk to and all this stuff. So there's this half of it that's blocking and tackling, get your list. And then there's this other half of it, which is, hey, fuck, it's kind of the wild, wild west. <laughs> Like if you want to get a viral video, to your point, do 10 videos and fucking see what you can make happen and, and on and on, right? Yeah, no, that, that's totally it. It is completely Wild West. There's kind of like, there's the block and tackle stuff that you want to at least get, you know, your funnel straight so that when people come to look for your product, they find you and you get them in the sales pipeline. But then, yeah, everything on top of that is just crazy. And like another crazy thing too, like we don't see, Facebook is is gaining ground, but it's still not like WeChat over in, Asia, you know, where that's like replacing the internet. Like people don't even go to the web. They just stay on WeChat and stay in there all the time. So, you know, will Facebook kind of pick up that space? I don't know, but it's just, yeah, it's definitely wild west. I mean, that's what supports the whole show is that everything is changing every week. You know, there's always new stuff to experiment and play with and, you know, some of it will blow you up, but you just keep, keep plugging. Now, who are the guests that you've had um, that you were most excited about and that, that you feel like you learned the most from? Um, uh, you know, Seth Godin has been on a bunch of times. He's kind of, uh, it's interesting too, because he kind of started out as permission marketing was his thing. And he's kind of ventured way over into the, the self-help entrepreneur kind of thing. Um, but when I started, you know, over 10 years ago, I was like, all right, if I can get him on the show, it's going to be a hit and managed to end up getting him on like within two years or something. Um, why, why did you think having him on would make the show a hit and, and did it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it, it totally did. You know, I mean, that was like, you know, and you can count on, you know, anytime I get a big name in, that's good for another four or 5,000 downloads, you know? Um, and I think it's just kind of, as you, you get in the space, you have, you know, your gurus that you kind of key off of and you think they're huge. And, you know, maybe later on you find out that, Oh, actually, you know, it's not as, as giant as you think, but, um, but yeah, it's actually funny. So to get him on, I um, he had blogged about Amazon reviews or something that was going on there. So I did a blog post and I said, hey, look, I, I want to hear what Seth has to say about negative reviews. So if he comments on this blog post, I'll give him a hundred bucks. And sure enough, within about a month, you know, somebody who knew him, who knew him, told him about it. And he came out, I was like, all right, you know, you can give the hundred bucks to Kiva to charity. I don't, I don't need any money, but he answered. And so that was kind of, you know, that now I had his email address. And, uh, and then of course, just next time he had, a book now I got out, I your like, email, I'm going to get you. That's it. There was, he, you know, th th I didn't have a drip yet, but you know, we knew that. And, and this is the same with all the, you know, just another podcasting thing. Anybody's, you know, anytime somebody drops a book, if you're able to tell them, look, I've got people that like to buy books, you know, you're going to get the interview. You can lock it in. Um, and yeah, it's interesting, you know, uh, 
when we started Legends and Losers, I had no idea if anybody was going to come on, particularly because of how different the show is, right? Where you have a very nice, civilized, appropriate, <laughs> uh, the length is right, the dialogue's right, that, you know, you're, 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 you have a very consumable business show. Um, Legends and Losers, as you well know, is very different than that. <laughs> It's, well, yeah, no, this is your, you know, it's real storytelling. It's not, it's not made for radio. That's for sure. Well, and it's also, um, you know, chasing zebras down rabbit holes. Right. And so uh, I had no idea if people would want to have these free range conversations and I had even less idea. Would anybody ever listen to a, a crazy free range conversation we had as a review recently the, the the reviewer said something to the effect of and every once in a while they have a business conversation they talk about business <laughs> right um and so that's just been a, a a fascinating thing but anyway my point is i had no idea whether or not we'd be able to get people to come on uh you know on the language and all of it right and uh we've had no trouble with that whatsoever <laughs> and there have been very few people that we've reached out to um, that have said no. Yeah, oh, well, people love to promote their own stuff. I mean, that's, as long as you have some, uh, some traction and it's not the amateur hour, then yeah, you'll, you'll, I mean, it's insane. I spend, you know, 20 minutes each morning clearing out all the inbound. Once you get on a couple PR lists, I had the, the puppy lady get pitched to me this morning. I think we had to pass on that the, one. The what, the what lady? The puppy lady. Some thing with puppies that she does with business or something or other. Just a quick pass on that one. How do you keep up? How do you keep up with the inbound? Because uh, we're finding it harder and harder. Yeah, that's, uh, there's no trick to that. You know, my only thing with that is I do have like five, um, you know, form letter scripts and Gmail, you save them as saved responses. And so I can just in two clicks, you know, okay, yeah, here's what you need. If we like your book, here's, a lot of them is we don't interview CEOs, but if you want to sponsor the show, here's the rate card. And um, yeah, you know, a, a couple along those lines. And then there's a lot what of them do you too. Mean you don't interview CEOs. Uh, well, the classic PR pitch is, Hey, the CEO of this company has made, you know, a hundred million dollars this quarter. We'd love to be on your show. And my response back is, well, you know, the majority of our guests are published authors. You know, we tend to like to talk about. Oh, I see. So, so you come up with a reason why their guest is not right. Yeah, 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 why it's probably not a fit for us. Um, you know, and then the good one is, it, you know, as you're looking at the pitches, like if one comes in, it's just obviously a form letter, you know, hi, comma, we love your show. Those just archive, you don't have to yeah, respond. Absolutely. Um, you know, then you get the other ones. So, you know, there's PR people that are smart enough to ping me over at the event hero address, you know, and if somebody catches me over there, I'll, you know, say, hey, you know, yeah, nice job. Here's Here's some things to think about. You know, if you've got a published book or you can pitch me something that's, about marketing tools. You know, you, if somebody is sharp enough to, to get through the clutter, they give them a couple extra pointers. I'm reminded of a funny story and I, I shouldn't say who it is, but so, you know, there's a, 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 well, a very well-known thinker and author in Silicon Valley who's written, he wrote a very important book about, I don't know, 10 or 12 years ago and, and he's written some follow-ups and he's a friend of a friend. And so he had, he had a new book coming out this fall and uh, I don't know him, um, but respect his work tremendously and, and thought it would be cool to have him on. So uh, via the friend got connected to him and look with all due modesty, the friend who's a mutual friend is a non-trivial person in Silicon Valley. And so this friend says, Hey, um, Eric, you know, you should talk to Chris about coming on Legends and Losers. And so, so we have this nice email exchange. It's like, oh, I'd love to. Maybe we can do a book giveaway, whatever, whatever. And um, then the PR person circles back and says, well, um, you know, could we spend a few minutes with you on the phone? And I'm like, <laughs> and, and you know what's coming, right? <laughs> so I get on the call. I say, fine. I get on the call with her and she, and she states, I said, okay, so what, what, you know, what would you like to talk about? Oh, you know, like I said in the email, we just want to coordinate this and that and follow up on the show. And, and so we spend, you know, 10 minutes on that shit. And then, um, and then we get to the real reason. And I had suspected this all along. She's like, okay, well, we'll get back to you and let you know. I said, what do you mean get back to me and let you know? She said, oh, well, you know, there's a lot of pressure on so-and-so's time and this and that and the other. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll let you know if we want to do your show. 
<laughs> right, right. So I yeah, sent that's... her and I sent him an email and I told him to go fuck themselves. <laughs> if you have to think about whether or not we fit your, you know, we meet your bar. We meet your PR plan. Yeah, yeah. Fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to talk about it. Yeah. Right. So, but, but I, I would have expected more of that kind of bullshit, but, um, actually not, not that much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's like anything. It's like, you know, the bigger you go up the corporate chain, the more people are involved and suddenly it's, you know, it's like business should be simple, right? It should be keep the customers happy, keep the money flowing. But instead it's like, Oh no, we're going to offend this group if we do that. And you know, if I hire this guy, it's, you know, this guy could eventually be my competition. I mean, all this political garbage and bureaucratic crap, it just chokes the life out of everything. Well, and the other interesting thing for me is, um, you know, having been a CMO, I've never been on the receiving end of all this stuff, <laughs> uh, right? So now I know what it's like to, and I don't, I'm not a journalist, but I know, I know at least on this dimension, what this feels like. Yeah, what it looks like from the other, because you're totally like, okay, so either he doesn't want to do it and doesn't have the balls to tell me, or, you know, he's just not paying attention to the PR person and he's going to lose his shot here. I actually, you know, and in this case, the person didn't uh, fire back and, you know, I probably didn't leave him uh, enough of a door, (laughs) (laughs) but I, 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 I was so fucking pissed. I have a feeling it wasn't him. It was his PR agent. Um, and it just, it reminded me of, wow, when you hire people to rep your, represent you, they better do a fucking good job. And, yeah, uh, and it, they're missing the P.T. Barnum side of things, you know, because it's like, there's only three things that can happen, right? Like one, it just, it will go okay and it'll do well. Two, you'll like spark a controversy and you're going to get a ton of traffic. And dude, most people nowadays just like, we don't care how you get the traffic. Like if you get a lot of traffic, that's it. I got a platform. You can always correct what you said or apologize or whatever, you know, or the stuff that fails, it just gets ignored completely. You know, nobody ever clicks on it. Nobody ever looks at it. It's like, it doesn't exist. So the only thing is the time lost. I guess some, you know, some execs are like, I don't even have, you know, I'm triple booked. That's always the, the big one. Yeah. Everybody's triple booked. You got too much shit on your calendar when you're triple booked. You know, they think, uh, you know, it's been over a decade since I was, you know, um, put the gloves on. But um, I really found it was important as a CMO, as an executive to purposely build um, think time into the calendar. And for me, most of it was actually done on planes. And I, as much as I love Wi-Fi on planes, and I do, there's a real downside to it because, you know, the flight from San Francisco to Boston was a surefire way for me to get six private hours. And, you know, I can remember people saying to me, oh, well, you know, if we don't come up with the big idea we need for this thing, whatever the thing was, all we'll do is we'll just put, you know, Lockhead <laughs> on a fucking plane to Boston. Fly and, him uh, to Kuala Lumpur, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, make sure that the, the flight attendants know to keep the JD coming. And by the time he gets back, we'll have the big idea because it was the only place as an executive at that time in my life where I could be quiet and alone and undisturbed for, you know, six to 12 hours, whatever it was. Oh, yeah, totally. The, and, you know, I remember – you know, you'd have the chance to like I'd have a stack of magazines, like I'd have a hard time carrying it on the plane. And just as I was going, I was ripping pages out, you know, and have 10 pages to take home when I'm done. That's all ancient history. Now you have a hard time finding a magazine here or there. Well, yeah. And it's like, um, we had, um, Dan McGinn, um, from HBR on legends and losers. Um, he's got a great new book actually that uh, he might be a good guest for you guys. His book is called psyched up. And what he did was a set of analysis around, what is it that legendary people do before the big speech, before the big pitch, before the big game, before the big sales call, before the big you know, interview, whatever it is, to like mentally prepare themselves to, to, to perform in that moment? Um, because you see so many people who have all of the training, all of the skills, all of the experience, and in that moment, they melt like snow in July. And so... <laughs> Anyway, that's what his book's about. But uh, l- long story longer, you know, the HBR is, is on fire right now, you know, because people are craving, um, craving quality. And uh, I found that great. I've been inspired by the HBR since I was a young man. And long story, way longer. 
when I like, I like to read the HBR on planes. I you know, sit there and there's some nice person who brings me a Jack Daniels every 20 minutes and just read the fucking thing. Just be in, just be there and read it. It's a very powerful thing to be alone and just have that, right? Yeah, not have the constant interruptions. You know, that's the thing because we just get crushed with text messages and emails. And it's, you know, all that stuff is urgent, but it's not important. You know, that's the thing. It's you've got to cut aside that time for the important stuff. I think working out is another huge one. You know, if you tack aside an hour so that you can go, you know, go for a run or go to the gym or whatever. But yeah, where you've got that time to actually think and and get stuff going. Or it's a, you know, morning time too, you know, just in the shower, you know, you have these free moments where you can put some brain power towards it. And I don't know, I've always been a fan of, you know, at lunchtime, go do something, get away from the machine, shut off the screen and let your mind kind of run wild because yeah, that's, you know, when you actually do the real thinking and the thing is that's where you get the breakthroughs, you know, it's, it's like, yeah, you, you can make it through yeah. the grind, but you know, at the end of the month, have you done anything amazing? That's the real question. Well, and actually the cool thing about that, um, at Mercury, uh, we, we moved offices. When I first got there, we had the shittiest offices possible. And I used to say to Amnon, our CEO, Hey, Amnon, we got the mojo of a trucking company going out of business. <laughs> I mean, fucking a, like, first of all, this is the most Dilbert depressing place to go work. And second of all, we have customers who come here and we ask them for like 10 million bucks. And, uh, I don't, I, I don't know. Do you know the geography around the Bay Area reasonably, John? Are you yeah, yeah, sure. A million times. Do you know where Milpitas is by chance? <laughs> Dude, it is. That's like trucking capital of California. Well, and I remember, and you know, we probably have ten thousand listeners in Milpitas who will never, <laughs> never come back. But when, when, when I first moved here, you know, I moved here from Toronto, Canada, and of course, the first thing you notice is like, holy fucking a pr- house prices, like a lot different, right? So you're sort of having us this 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 coronary about house prices and and so i'm looking around and i remember saying to my real estate agent at the time this is 20 years ago uh you know hey why are things so much cheaper in milpitas and she said it's because of the smell (laughs) because milpitas has the biggest fucking dump i think in the bay area and it it stinks like shit like like uh, terrible and so you at Mercury, when I first moved, you'd, you'd go outside to have like a, you know, a sandwich at lunch and enjoy some nice sunshine and maybe get some fucking, you know, a little color in your skin. And, but you'd be sitting there eating a tuna sandwich and these, these wafts from the fucking dump. Anyway, long story longer. When we finally got serious, we moved into this very, very nice ding dong campus that uh, my friend Peter Curry, who at the time was the CFO of um, Netscape built. And, uh, and we ended up inheriting that, so to speak, at, at Mercury. And so we had this nice campus, and it was like a college campus. That's kind of how it felt. And so to your, to, to your point, I would have meetings and I'd just say, hey, let's go for a walk. And we'd just walk around the campus. And yeah, then a few years know. afterwards, I was on the board of this company who was headquartered in Palo Alto. And I would do the same thing. You know, just, hey, great, you get meeting? Awesome. Let's go. Where are we going? We're just going to walk up and down University Avenue in Palo Alto and, you know, enjoy the day and chit chat and get some sun. And, and uh, yeah, that can make a big difference. And isn't it insane with a lot of the places now doing these huge bullpens, you know, it's like everybody's sitting in a big pool and then there's all these other distractions. They got the coffee bar and the foosball table and there's movies going like all this crap. You're like, dude, how does anyone ever, you know, get, any get a fucking shit in? done? Yeah. Yeah. And multitasking is bullshit. It's the biggest bullshit thing we ever got, you know, sold on. And I can't remember years ago, I read this book about why it was bullshit. But the biggest example I remember in it was, if you think you can multitask, next time you go out to dinner and the bill comes, try to stay in the conversation while you're calculating the tip. Yeah, it's yeah, fucking it's impossible. A- you know, we can, you can multitask four or five things that require no attention. You know, you can <clears throat> chew gum, unlock your car and listen to music. Yeah, that's fine. But dude, we're human cognitive power. You got to put all of it pointed toward whatever you're doing at the time, because yeah, you, you can't do more than one thing at once and get it right a hundred percent of the time. Yeah. I mean, when I'm writing, I, uh, un, I, I turn my email application off. 
I turned my browser, I shut my browser, I shut my email, I shut all that stuff. And I put on a set of headphones and I listen to some real rock and roll and, and I go to work. I said, I'm going to sit here for two hours. I'm going to do this work. Cause if, 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 you know, if Firefox is open or you, God forbid, get that ping, <laughs> you're gone for 15 minutes. And That's if you're me, that 15 minutes can be two hours and you could do like a lot of nothing. <laughs> Lose a whole day yet. Yeah. Like, hey, That's what did I do? I don't know. I, I, I found all these funny cat videos. Uh, there were some very alluring ladies who distracted me for a little while and a whole bunch of other shit in between. And uh, fucking A, I haven't written anything. <laughs> I haven't gotten anything done yet. Yeah, and that's, you know, it's like classic time management that of, you know, I take the calendar and you throw in all the big stuff. You know, like here's the stuff I have to get done this week no matter what. And you work around that. You know, it's like, okay, I know it's going to take three hours to do this, but I need to set aside an hour to answer email or to take these calls or, you know, whatever stupid stuff. But yeah, you know, by the time Friday comes around you got to make sure that the the four most important things got done there's no there's no escape in that there's no escape in that yeah so you gotta you gotta have some discipline around that shit and it's getting tougher but um yeah and so what else is on your mind john as a marketer uh let's see other stuff that's you know um I, so i've become very zen in my old age you know <laughs> like it used to be i was i was all about like again you know, the 19 traction points, there's all these tactics that you can do. And really when you like strip all the crap away, it's, you know, sell more stuff to more people. Like that, that's all it is. Like as long as you're closing deals and, and the customers are happy, like you're successful and everything else is just getting in your way. Um, <clears throat> Cause the one account-based management, like that, that's been all the rage for this past year of like, you know, don't sell the individuals you sell to the whole account. And it's like, why is this such an amazing revolution? It's like every account-based team that's had half a brain for the past 10 years has had a spreadsheet of like, okay, here's the 10 accounts that we sell no matter what and we do whatever we can do to them. But now suddenly there's all these tools spinning up around it and all this other stuff. So, um, yeah. I can remember back in the day taking, um, do you remember the sales training company Miller Hyman? Oh yeah, got that. I've, I've done yeah, been the through blue it. Blue sheets and all that shit. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. And yeah, they right. had a program called Lamp. I remember it to this day. Large account management, and that's what it was. And I took the large account management class. I don't know, fucking twenty five years ago. <laughs> right, this is right. not. This is not new. You know, it's yeah, interesting. We had uh, Mark Tim on Legends and Losers, and he's one of the senior executives at the uh, Zig Ziglar organization. And Zig's the guy that taught me to sell in the quote unquote uh, uh, in my automobile university. Yep. Car university, right? Right. right I love that. And, um, and, and one of the things Mark says, it's so fucking powerful. He's like, yeah, there's a lot of places you can learn how to sell. We don't teach people how to sell. Zig teaches people how to close. And I love that distinction. And so yeah, there, there, I guess my point is when you get into some of this complex blue sheeting shit, which I think there's some real validity to. So I don't, I'm not shitting on it per se. I think strategically mapping out who the account is, figuring out who the influencers are. And I think most importantly, figuring out who the economic buyer is, who's the person who can say yes and who are the people who can't. And all that shit, thinking that shit through is very, very, very smart and having a plan around it. And if I'm a rep of the field, how do I leverage my product folks? How do I leverage my executives to get further up in the org chart? All of that shit, absolutely. And it can get a little too analytic sometimes, right? Oh, yeah, totally. And, you know, it's like, you know, podcasters focusing on microphones, uh, artists focusing on the paintbrush they use, you know, writers focusing on the pencil or the word process. So like, yeah, these things are important, but the, the important part is to go do the damn work and do it over and over again so that you learn what the art is, you know, so that you can get thrown into that. And it, it's only by doing it over and over again that you start to be able to decode, <clears throat> you know, when you're selling to an account, you'll, you'll hear clues that will tip you off as to who is the economic decision maker. You know, like you'll be dealing with all these people on the front line who want to spreadsheet you and all this stuff. And yeah, it's, you know, just having more tools for all this stuff. Like, it, yeah, it can help. It can make your life easier, but it's just, it's not where the magic happens. You know, it, it's all, 
further up the chain. You got to earn your stripes by putting those tools to work on the battlefield. And, and I, I assume that uh, you did it for my benefit, but I, uh, how, whatever motivated you, I, I got to tell you that I notice and appreciate the copy of Play Bigger uh, uh, in, in the background there on your shelf, and it's prominently displayed at the top. Yes, exactly. Play smaller. It's much small, but yes, the exact. Very, uh, uh, very, uh, very fancy of you to have that prominently displayed. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, man. The display, uh, the whole case. Yeah, the display just, ad. That's right. That's right. Click here. That's right. If we're on YouTube, click here to get your copy today. Also, B two B marketing confessions, right there. And uh, oh yeah, Sammy Hagar. That's his uh, uh, beach rum, right there. So. Oh, we love we love. It. Sammy made a lot of money in the booze business, didn't he? He said he's made like the money he's made in music is chump change compared to what he's made on alcohol. The number that. R- the number that I remember was 70 million, but. Yeah. Cause I think what he sold Cabo to like one of the, you know, it, there's like one of four of these humongous liquor conglomerates and uh, yeah, Cabo bought that. So I think he just totally. Yeah. I'm just seeing if we can find it quickly. Sammy Hagar tequila purchase. They're going to, they're going to try to sell me tequila. Yeah. Buy premium tequila. Uh, <laughs> To see if company purchase gets it. He sold, yeah, there it is. He sold 80% of Cabo Wabo tequila to Grupo Campari. Campari for 80 million yeah, yeah, bucks. Dude, there's, now, there's you know, John, you can't, you can't live on that, but it's a nice start. <laughs> it's, yeah, you're, you're not worried about where the next meal is coming from after you have a, an 80 million hit. Yeah. Now, of course, you know, in, in the part of the world that we live in, 80 million bucks on the top line is, is 40 million bucks on the bottom. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, After taxes and everyone else has had their. No, people don't realize in California, uh, we have 60% tax. Is that you, the end? Yeah, no, I, I like that. Look, I, look, I'm no accountant, so fucking A. But you sort of look at federal, state on income, and that's where people stop. It's like, no, 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 no. We have fucking, I think it's 9% sales tax in California. It's very fucking high. So everything we buy or almost everything we buy. And then you got your property tax. And of course, your property tax, the number they give you, the percentage of the value of your property isn't your real property tax because they got the fucking school improvement thing and the this improve, And that's always there. Right? That's, that's never not. That's <laughs> not going to go away. No, that's the like a cell phone charge. Right, right. Those are always there. So there's just always that. So, Look, if it's not, if we're, if, if, if we don't, in California, if we don't work for Uncle Sam until August, we sure as shit <laughs> till, till July. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, and that's this whole um, uh, Austin, Texas. You know, I see so many guys before they sell, bail down to Austin and buy a house down there just to dodge the taxes. Well, you know, that's so funny. So I, I, I of course, had this idea, right? And, uh, and so I was going to buy a place in Nevada. And uh, this has been tried. The government doesn't agree. <laughs> when you have oh, when yeah, you're yeah, someone yeah. like me and you have, you know, virtually all of your income in California, uh, yeah, you, you can move across the state line in Lake Tahoe and claim that you don't have to pay any state income tax anymore because you now live in Nevada. But uh, California is going to go tell you to fuck yourself. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I well, and you, just, you I don't hit know a certain point where, where, you know, you hit a certain level and now they're going to chase you no matter what. They don't care. Yeah, no, we're, we're, uh, we're always in partnership with Uncle Sam. But listen, I got nothing to complain about. As uh, Fernando Valenzuela famously said, America's <laughs> been very, very good to me. So, uh. All right, well, John, hey, is there anything else before we kick out of this wave? Uh, let me see. Uh, I did have a list of stuff. Yeah, you got um, some more stuff? I, I'll take whatever you got. You know, one was, uh, I just wanted to plug Kat Hoke. She has a book coming out. She's somebody that you might want to think about as a guest. She's done a bunch of, it's prison reform stuff, like getting uh, people who are ex-cons, you know, on entrepreneurial track. So I went to- What's her name? Because her book is uh, Kat Hoke, K-A-T, Catherine Hoke, H-O-K-E. Um, and and I her mission in life is to get ex-cons to be entrepreneurs? Yeah, yeah. She has some insane thing, like, you know, the the recidivism rate for- normal jails is like 80% end up back in and hers is down at like 7% or something like that. Because oh, I, I have to meet her. Yeah. It's kind of, it's, it's definitely, you know, that kind of the bigger social good thing. And, and you know, um, I, I didn't think a lot about this and, 
um, you know, when you retire, you have time, you have the gift of time. Uh, and Legends and Losers has taught me so much. And so if you had said to me that, uh, A, um, one of the people that you respect and admire the most, and one of the top 10 most inspirational people you've ever met in your life, and, some, and, and, and somebody you'd fall in love with, was going to be a convicted murderer, I would have told you not possible. But we had convicted murderer Will Little on Legends and Losers, and Will Little is one of, look, I'm gonna say something outrageous. I think he's one of the most important people in America today. Really, what's, what's, his, what's he got going on? You know, he grew up in Philadelphia and ended up on the wrong side of the street and, uh, you know, was in drug gangs. No dad, um, you know, a drug addict mom. Tough, like a fucking tough upbringing, right? Ended up in the gangs and ended up in a firefight and, um, you know, then ends up in jail. But here's the interesting thing. So he goes to jail and he gets sentenced to 20 years. And um, his girlfriend is pregnant with his first child when he goes to jail. She's a few months pregnant. And he says to himself that he's going to, these were his words, rehumanize himself because he wasn't going to do to his child what he felt like his father did to him. And so in prison, he embarks on a rehumanization project to reclaim his, his own humanity because he said to do the kinds of things that he did, you, you had to bury your humanity. And, um, and he's just incredible. He lives in the same area where he, he grew up, and his mission is to uh, make a difference for young people and for everybody else in the community. He has, um, he has uh, made peace with the family of, of the young man who he, uh, who he shot, and he dedicated his, uh, his book to that young man, and he now uh, makes a living as a barber, a poet, and a public speaker. And he's starting to get booked all around the country. And um, there's a couple of things about documentary swirling. Anyway, listen, here's my prediction. In the next decade, hopefully sooner, uh, Will Smith plays Will Little in a movie because his life is a movie. And it's when you see him in front of the room, you know how when a speaker at a conference goes to speak, like there's a bunch of people on their fucking phones and all <laughs> that shit going on. When Lil, Will Little walks up in front of the room, everybody in the room is doing one thing, staring and listening at Will Little. And then when he reads a poem, everything changes. And so he's, he's uh, it, look, it sounds corny, but meeting him and hanging out with him is, uh, is almost like a religious experience. He just, you, you, he puts you in touch with your own humanity because of who he is. And so that's a long winded way of saying, uh, I have, he has given me a window into this world that I never could have understood without him. And so, um, I would love to meet Kat. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it will definitely get you connected. Cause yeah, it's just amazing. And it, there's this whole thing of, we, you know, so much of like, uh, of what has gone on with tech and social and all this stuff is kind of showing us the same media crap, but there's this whole other level of where we can see people for who they really are and what they're about. And yeah, you know, the people who have done bad things, the majority of them, that was the only alternative they had, you know, they got forced into some kind of situation and they're still human. They're not monsters, you know? And well, and at least in the United States, 90% of them are kind of going to, going to come out of prison. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Right. The revolving door will, will spin them back out. And even, I don't know, there's just, oh, I could go on about this forever, but there's so much we could, we need to look at. It's like, how many of these people are d dangerous to the public? Like, you know? If people are using drugs, us giving them a place to live and four meals for five years in jail, like that's not doing anybody any good. You know, it, it's not like they're a danger to society. Well, I, I just, think drugs being illegal is absolutely insane. Is, right. That look, in itself is who crap. is the government? Who is the government to tell us what we can and can't do with our own bodies? Yeah, no, that's it, well, it's an industry. You know, I mean, it's just, I'm not uh, hurting someone else. Look, I, I'm not a big fan of people doing heroin and stuff. Right. I, I want to see people live incredible lives, not, not compromised, miserable lives. But that said, you know, w w we had um, John DeVore on Legends and Losers. Well, John DeVore is the captain of the Red Bull Air Force, and he flies a fighter jet 
at over 200 to sometimes 300 miles an hour, and there's no plane, <laughs> right? He flies wingsuits. He's the captain of the Red Bull Air Force. And every movie that you've seen, Transformers, uh, Speed 2, uh, all of that shit, if there's somebody flying, it's John in the Red Bull yeah, Air Force. Him. John gets that call. He's the guy. <laughs> He's the guy. If you want people flying in a movie, uh, uh, is it Richard Bay, the big time movie? I don't know this world, but. Oh, Michael Bay. That, yeah, yeah. Michael Bay, excuse me. Michael Bay calls John. Now, look, you could look at it and go, hey, listen, uh, flying with nothing surrounding you at 300 <laughs> miles, two feet off the side of a cliff is a very scary, dumb thing to do because a lot of people die doing that. So we should have legislation to save John from being John, right? And <laughs> yeah, so yeah, to me, doing drugs himself. is in the same thing. It's like, well, listen, if you want to snort cocaine, snort cocaine. John wants to fly. That's how he chooses to fly. If you want to fly some other way, like, and, and so, you know, on this stuff, I have a much more uh, libertarian point of view. If you're doing it and you're not hurting, hurting other people, then have at it. Yeah, no, that's, I don't know. It's, and it's just, isn't it's all over the map. It's like, it's easy to buy drugs. Anybody can have a baby without a license, but you know, to drive a car, you got to go get tested. I mean, it's just, if there's anything no you sense. should have to have a license for, right. To have there should it, be yeah, a it, test, right? Oh, sorry. Right. You don't get to make a you're, person. <laughs> you're making the most dangerous weapon of all another human being, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine that? Who gets to decide? But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, if you're not going to hurt anybody else, then, then, then have at it. And if you want to blow your liver up drinking or, you know, blow your veins up <laughs> shooting heroin and, you know, have at it. But uh, I digress. All right. Uh, so, so cat hope. Excellent. Anything else on your mind, John, while you're on a roll here? <laughs> yeah. You know, while I'm running here. I know I don't want to, we're running, running huge. Um, oh, oh, this was, uh, yeah, it's, I had this on the notes just in case I ran to, <clears throat> uh, when you're talking with uh, Tim, with Timo, it, you'd mentioned, Helen Keller saying life is lived at point blank. Right. And, and I just started, I was like, no, dude, Helen Keller didn't have anything to do with firearms. So yeah, it's Jose Ortega Gasset was the one who says life is lived at point blank. Uh, <laughs> Helen Keller did not, <laughs> Helen Keller did not have guns. You're, you're fact checking me. So hold on, let's get this right. I, I love it. I love it. So wh what's the gentleman's name? Uh, Jose, oh yeah, I'll just send you the link to this. Jose Ortega. Tega. Here we go. Copy this. So why did I think Helen Keller said it? I don't know, but it was so funny when you had this, this quote of Helen Keller said you live life at point blank. I was just like, I, the picture of Helen Keller with a weapon just, you know, got me laughing. There we go. There we go. There's a... I'm trying to see, did my whiskey soaked mine just like <laughs> yeah yeah the, you guys were, were oh no no that was up. Tim. it wasn't the other one you guys hadn't been hammering it but uh yeah you're right you're you're absolutely right i am a hundred percent one thousand jose <laughs> omega gas gasset yeah i don't know i i, I don't I speak don't spanish so I'm, I'm gonna go that, yeah, but yeah, just, gonna, and so let's see what he says here he says, if you believe passiton.com, this looks like a bunch of quotes, it says, we cannot put off living until we are ready. The most salient characteristics of life is its urgency here and now without any possibility of postponement. Life is fired at us point blank. That's the translation on this website. Yeah, That's life it. is fired at us point blank. That's what the, here's goodreads.com. Uh, let's see what this is. Yeah, this is absolutely not Helen Keller. <laughs> yeah, he says, here, here's the longer quote. He says, life cannot wait until the sciences may have explained the universe scientifically. I don't know what that exactly means, but we cannot put off living until we are ready. The most salient characteristics of life is its cohesiveness. It's always urgent here and now without any possible po postponement. Life is fired at us point blank. You got any other corrections for me? Any retractions <laughs> that I need to? Uh... No, no, nothing is entertaining. The good news is, I have never pretended to be a journalist. 
And I think if you listen to Legends and Losers for five minutes, you're going to know that there's some stuff's going to get a little misconstrued. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. It's, we're, we're getting the big ideas across. That's all I have. <laughs> all right, John, anything else? No, no. Thanks, you know, thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure. I appreciate getting a chance to catch up with you. It's great catching up. And uh, I also got to tell you, just in completion, you know, it, it is so fun to think that we met pushing up on 30 years ago, right? <laughs> yeah, I know we didn't even tell the whole DCI story the, where you single-handedly destroyed the whole <laughs> e-marketing department in a, in a 20 minute speech. I mean, how did well, you want to throw that out? Why did I do that? How did I, I don't remember that. Was I terrible? You don't remember, I, yeah, well, no, no, it wasn't terrible. It was fantastic. But it, again, this is like classic unintended consequences. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll even tell your side of the story. So you were working with DCI. I was at DCI. This was my first e-marketer job. You know, we were doing email and web pages for these tech conferences. And you had been brought in because I, I, I don't know if it was like Vantive or Mercury when it was, but, you know, you kind of knew what the hell was going on in the space. And we would always do this. We would grab somebody who knows what's going on in the space and they would tell us like, yeah, these are the kind of keynotes you're looking for and these are the sponsors who are going to want to see this audience. And so we did the first CRM event, you know, in fact, you and the other guys there actually created the term CRM that came out of our marketing. Uh, it was such an back. exciting time. It was, yeah, it was all brand new. Nobody knew what the hell was going on and it was still the enterprise company, you know, these huge billion dollar companies doing this. Um, but so part of it was, so, you know, we were kind of experimenting with this email and it was going well. And one of the bosses was like, like, hey, we got this guy Lockhead. Let's bring him in at the Boston show and we'll bring our marketing team down there and you guys can spend like a half hour and he'll just tell you what's going on and you can talk about what's working. And, you know, basically we got access to a huge, you know, big time enterprise consultant, uh, which we normally would never get. And so there were like five of us around the table. And I remember you told the story. You were like, look, this is what's going on now is an opportunity that you will never see it again in our lifetime probably. And there's only going to be three kinds of people. There's going to be the people who are in the parade and there's going to be the people who are watching the parade saying, Oh, Hey, you know, they're spectators of the parade. And then there's the, the largest group, the third group that's going to be sitting around saying what parade and they're going to miss the boat. And so, so you gave that speech and, you know, they were expecting like our email and websites to improve over six months. Over the next six months, I think four out of five of us all jumped to other startups uh, from that point. So it wiped out the department entirely. Um, but all of us and, went and on. So you think it was my fault? I scared people to. Uh... But you showed us that, like, you know, this is a huge, this is not the time to be like sitting in the cubicle, cranking out email campaigns. Like this is the time to go take some risks, go, go to a startup and do something totally crazy. What and year do you think that would have, that conversation went down? That would have been like 98 or 99, probably um, somewhere around there. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, well, it was on, it was fucking on then. Yeah, it was, it was bizarre. And yeah, cause even one of the guys, Christian Vanek, He's got this company, he's uh, doing like 12 million a year and, you know, just totally crushed it. And, it, and he was, he was uh, you know, a tech genius. He was, not, he was the guy, he first explained to me how web pages don't have to be just the code. You could have uh, a computer call a database and make a web page that's totally dynamic. And that was like my brain melted. I was like, that, that's ridiculous. How can that even happen? And, uh, uh, but that's that's what it did, and we all ran from there. So yeah, that's a, and then the DCI story is like totally nuts after that too. The you know the the feds came in and they were hiding income in Bermuda. Were you there when all that went down? Uh, I had left before it fell. I was there when it was happening, so it was really weird. It was like there were I these mean, couple were you there of years. When the feds showed up. No, not when they yeah. The, and from what I understand, they didn't come to the company. They uh, they went to their houses and uh, and bag them and so the idea the thing was they had been burying money in bermuda and that was like questionably legal but the thing was a couple of years later they wanted to sell it and so they started claiming that income again so it looked really weird like their income exploded because they weren't funneling the money away and that's what got the fed's attention and they came in and audited him and then yeah the, the a couple people went to jail and the company got sold off um, to another company to kind of break some of the stuff free. But yeah, that was all. And so, you know, there's people, I guess, that missed bonuses and stuff because money had been funneled into weird places. It's totally a, yeah. It, it is very, thing. very weird. And, you know, the founder, CEO of the company, George Shusell, he went to jail for many years for tax evasion as a result of this, did he not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he went, he actually did time. Um, 
And, and he still maintains to this day too, that like, you know, this is stuff that bigger corporations do. Like they only drop the hammer on him because they could, you know, because he didn't have a legion of 20 lawyers to stretch it out for four or five years. And, you know, I don't know. So George doesn't feel like he did anything wrong. Um, he still thinks he's in the right. Yeah. I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm no expert on this. I haven't talked to George since I was there, but he does I, like, I've seen, he has a web page where he, in fact, I think he, you know, talks and writes about how this stuff is, is bullshit. Um, and, uh, and that's interesting. Stuff. You know, the fascinating thing about George is look, he went to jail for tax evasion. So uh, I don't know his point of view might be, I might agree with it if I dug into it. I didn't know that was his point of view. Uh, so, uh, you know, putting that to the side, the net of it is he went to jail for tax evasion. And, um, and so the interesting thing to me, John, is George was one of those people in my career who was very, very good to me, very kind to me, gave me chances to do things that I shouldn't have been given those chances. There was no evidence that would suggest that um, putting me in front of 3,000 people as one of the kind of main guys at a conference at age, you know, 24 years old, 25 years old was a good idea. Um, and yet he did those things and he was incredibly encouraging and, and he, he gave me, quote unquote, today what we would call his platform. I mean, he mailed my face out to mi- millions of times. Oh my right? God. I mean, how many of yeah, those? When you would do a big show, a big conference, how many brochures would you guys mail? We would do over a quarter million tech brochures. I would get a check for the post office for like fifty thousand uh, dollars, or even yeah, and that was just one of like four mailings that we would do. I mean, it was nuts. And so when you did those big DCI CRM shows, and you were doing a CRM show in San Francisco, by way of example, how many how many uh, conference brochures would you mail back in those days? Oh, uh, you know, the, fir- there'd be a drop of 250,000 that would go. Um, yeah. And so yeah. when somebody puts your face in front of 250,000 people and then they allow you to stand on their stage in front of, you know, three, 3,000 people, 2,000 people, whatever the numbers were, I mean, they were big numbers back then. Uh, you know, that's called being very, very kind. I was a nobody. I mean, I was a very young nobody. And, and so it's this interesting dichotomy about human beings uh, and how complex we are, right? Because on one hand, George Hussell was one of the nicest, kindest, uh, supportive people in my career. And I'll forever be grateful to him because you take him out of the mix and, you know, I don't know. You know, he made me, yeah, yeah. He made me a minor celebrity in, in that world, in the CRM world in those days. And that led to the next thing, which led to the next thing, which led to the next thing. So, you know, he was incredibly kind to me. And I know he was to many others as well. Um, my friend Shaku Atre has great, great memories of him. And yet he committed this tax fraud, right? And so it's just an interesting, he was very, very kind and had really good values and judgment around people. But if you believe he was in the wrong, you know, he did some bad shit around taxes and, and the government. Yeah, well, he, I mean, he was a brilliant guy too. I mean, Dr. Chassel, actually, you know, he has his doctorate. I mean, he's an incredibly smart guy. And I think, uh, you know, there comes a point where when you're looking at tax law, I mean, he would look and interpret and read that stuff and take it as word. And, you know, and as other people know, th- there's a lot of politics around that stuff. You know, it's yeah. like, you know, uh, Martha Stewart was not the biggest insider trading or, or Wall Street scumbag during her time, but she was the one who went to jail. And, you know, and it's, it's that. And look, I, of course, I don't know the details of that. So who the hell am I? And um, I spent about as much time in law school as I did flying through space. But <laughs> um, look, she might have done something stupid, but it was for an inconsequential amount of my money, given her net worth. I mean, it was, I can't remember the number, but 30, 40, 50 grand, some number like that, which for her, of course, was nothing. And so, yeah, there was something very weird about that. <laughs> Because like, yeah, if you're going to go is, tax evasion, right? If you're going to do it, fuck go big, right? <laughs> right. Make millions. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it, it's all that, you know, it all becomes theater at a certain point, you know, and it's no different than the TSA. You know, are we really safer because, you know, every 10 year old kid's getting their shoes checked at the airport? I mean, you know, there, there's a lot of, uh, you know, the TSA thing really drives me nuts because uh, have you ever flown to Israel by any chance? No, but I know what the story is that you basically strip naked, right? I mean, isn't that? Yeah, I mean, kind of. If you fly LL, I mean, if you fly uh, another airline, then they, they, you know, 
they use their uh, n- normal practices. But if you fly El Al, which is the Israeli national airline, um, yeah, it's different. You show up to check in at, you know, at um, whatever, pick your airport, and you're going to have, you have a 45-minute discussion with the El Al folks. And it's a very detailed discussion. Like, okay, John, uh, what are you going to be doing in Israel? Oh, well, I'm going to be, you know, giving a speech and meeting some folks. Okay, good. Um, are you going to be presenting your speech off your computer? Uh, yes, I am. Okay, great. Could you uh, pull out your computer and show me that speech? <laughs> and they, they stand there and they go, oh, you know, what's, what's CRM and what's, you know, and they, they do all this stuff, right? It's very... Yeah, just keep drilling. Yeah. And of course, we all know that um, there are air marshals on every flight. We know that the vast majority, if not all of their pilots are former military pilot. Like they're just, they're very serious about it. And if you fly LL, you have that experience and you go, oh, this is what security looks like. <laughs> this is like. what security should be. <laughs> yes. I can totally see that. Whereas on our planes, kind of not so much, right? And you know, every, every time you hear about this study, you know, the, people are getting guns through and all this shit, right? <laughs> and I don't know about you. I, I don't know if you do this, but um, I, on the plane, sit there and watch. I, well, I look at everybody in the area before we board. I watch them as they get on a plane. I, I pay attention on a plane, particularly at, at the front end of the trip and you know, try to suss everybody out. And I, and I, I, I got my eyes open the whole, the whole time. And not like a crazy person, but like it is maybe not in the, in the, my, the very front of my brain, but it's definitely in the first third of my brain. Like nothing happens on this fucking plane. <laughs> See, I've, I've gone the total route because I'm just, uh, you know, I guess OCD and panicked. I'm just like, look, here's the stats. Like it's a one in 2 billion chance that there's going to be a problem in this flight. So I'm not going to look at anybody. Like if I see, you know, five Iraqis getting on the plane, I'm not going to sweat and like freak out and ask to change flights. Like just close my eyes and it's going to be okay. Yeah, no, I've taken the opposite approach, which is I'm turning myself into Jason Bourne. Yeah, yeah, right. uh, (laughs) And I'm not so much of a racialist on the profiling. Um, Now, you know, 15 young, you know, maybe, right, uh, uh, of certain descents would come on the plane, but maybe. But, uh, you know, I'm friends with so many people of, of the different uh, parts of the world that are, that are uh, racial, that would normally be racially profiled in our country that I, I don't have that in me because I know Arabs and I know lots of people from the Middle East and I know you know, people get freaked out about Indians because they confuse, they can, <laughs> right, right. They, they think they're you know, Iraqi or something. They're yeah, Mexican. Something. Like anybody Brown is a suspect, right? So it's like, <laughs> like I, I had a lot of Brown in my life. Right. So they don't freak me out. Um, but weird behavior or anything along those lines or yeah, I'm just paying attention. You are not going <laughs> to get this that. plane. You were going to have to kill me. I'm hard to kill and you are not getting it. <laughs> Passenger 57. This yeah. See, I'm, 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 I'm like, um, uh, I want to be like, um, oh, what the fuck's his name? Uh, Neeson. Um, the, the, oh, the Liam Neeson. Yeah. Liam, <laughs> Liam Neeson, right? And have a particular he, set of skills. I love that line. I love, <laughs> I have a particular set of skills. Yeah. And so, uh, and I love the fact that like he's in his sixties and he was a <laughs> right. classically trained actor. And now he's like this, this sort of modern day, I don't know, super yeah, Charles actor. Bronson. He's the new Charles Bronson. That's right. Like- and actually there's a new movie of his coming out and it looks like the same fucking movie. <laughs> Uh, Dude, they just make the same damn thing over and over again, right? His kids get in trouble. He goes, starts killing people. Totally. No, it's exactly what's going on. I saw an ad for it the other day and I said to my wife, I said, hey, baby, look, they've fucking done Taken 47 <laughs> and I can't wait to see it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, a, it's your escape. You can't wait to, to watch that stuff too. Totally. Right? I just, I want to see Liam Neeson kick some bad guy's asses. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, dude. Rocky 47, Creed 6. I don't care. Just keep them coming. I'll just, watch them Just all. keep them coming. Irish, here it is from the mirror. Dot I, Irish mirror.ie. <laughs> Irish actor Liam Neeson getting rave reviews for latest action blockbuster, <laughs> The Commuter. Yeah. Rave reviews. Rave reviews. Liam Neeson is done again. One rave reviews. 
at the age of 65. And man, he looks fucking great. Oh yeah, Rich is the best lotion, right? That's the... Uh, but he doesn't look like one of those weird actors who's fucked his face. <laughs> up Had stuff. bad work done, yeah. You know those 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 like the 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 share look where they can only do surprised. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's just the the work shows first. They they don't look like what they used to look. It's like the Renee Zwelliger thing. It's just like I I didn't recognize her. I didn't even know it was her. Oh, I didn't. Did she fuck her face up too? She had a lot of work done. Yeah, yeah. It's just when you look at like the diary of uh, bridget jones you know you look like pictures from that from today it's like it, it's not the same person you know what I mean? what's, what's her name again uh that? uh renee zwelliger she Ren- was like married to kenny chesney for 20 minutes too that was a whole nother no oh, we're getting down to Cardassian. It's well see i don't know any that. of this stuff i pay no attention really to this <laughs> stuff uh and so oh yeah no she looks really fucking weird <laughs> She was adorable. She was kind of like, you know, when she did all those Hugh Grant movies and stuff, right? Was, isn't that her? Yeah, yeah. Isn't, see, that's the, that's the thing that kills me. She was people, America's sweetheart. I mean, she was she, the girl yeah. next door we all thought Looked was. Like, yeah, yeah. She was yeah, the girl be, you had the crush on too, you know? And you everybody like, loved her, right? Like I, guys loved her. Gals loved her. She was your sister. She was your girlfriend. She was your, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. she looks a little weird. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know why the fuck they did, but Liam looks fucking great. <laughs> he's he's ready to dish it out he's yet ready. again. That's it. He's ready. The body count. <laughs> you took the wrong. Yeah, and see, here's the premise for the movie. It's the same fucking movie every time. They just switch <laughs> it from planes to. He says, uh, "He's a retired cop now living in the suburbs." It's always that way, right? It's like <laughs> it's ex, totally different. Right? The ex Navy he was SEAL. a military guy. Now he's a cop, right? Or, or the Navy SEAL has opened a popsicle stand because <laughs> he's retired too. He's from the suburb of Chicago. This is, he suddenly offered 100,000 pounds by a mystery woman to help to find someone on the train who, he does, who does not belong there. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. yeah, it's like take and meet speed on a train. Yeah, right, right. It's always the, that one guy they hadn't expected. Who, uh, <laughs> See, here's, here's what they say. The, 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 this is a quote from the Hollywood Reporter. Anyone who's seen Neeson in the Taken franchise should know by now that you do not mess with the man's brethren. <laughs> I love that. See, I'm trying to be, to I'm trying to be Liam Neeson, and on a plane, I, that's who I'm going to be. <laughs> Don't fuck with this plane, or I'll <laughs> take you out. <laughs> I can make life very uncomfortable. I have a very special set of skills. <laughs> very special skill. I've I can, developed I can, over many years. I can market the shit out of you. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> I'll promote your, your shit from here to the rest of the world. From the plane now. All right, John, anything else? No, no, that's it. I think I, I've worked it out here. Hopefully I'd have to uh, save something for another time. All right. Well, um, thank you so much. I'm a huge fan of the show. I'm stoked that you had me on. I think it's really a blast that, you know, you and I knew each other back in the day and we've reconnected and uh, I respect and admire the shit out of your show. And uh, thanks for your time. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. And yeah, we will. uh, We'll keep talking. Be legendary, my friend, as I know you will. Whew. Fantastic. Thank you so much, John. I really appreciate you being on. And if you love this conversation, if you know, if you have friends who work in marketing, uh, enemies who work in marketing, (laughs) uh, maybe uh, new younger people coming up in marketing, anybody who wants to be a marketing executive, why not share it with them right now? And we would love you just a little bit extra if you shared this episode with John on social media immediately. We'd also like to ask you to go to legendsandlosers.com right now and subscribe. And if you do, uh, you'll never miss any of the hilarity. We'll keep you up to date with what's going on with new episodes. We'll keep you up to date with what's going on with uh, our new book, Niche Down, and other fun stuff that we are up to here at Legends and Losers. Now, um, is your business set up to spot trouble before it happens? According to the Harvard Business Review, most major revenue stumbles could have been avoided if you had an early warning system. Well, that early warning system, by far, for most, most growth businesses, is from NetSuite. And I'd encourage you to go to netsuite.com slash legends right now. Uh, Because what you'll do if you go there is you can set up 
a discussion, a conversation with a growth expert in your industry who can help you identify early warning signs in your business that'll, that'll, that are barriers to growth. Um, uh, NetSuite as an application provides you visibility into what's really happening in your business. Organizations like the Girl Scouts, GoPro, uh, Big Agnes Tents, uh, the Oakland Athletics, Guide Dogs for the Blind, and Zendesk rely on NetSuite because NetSuite is the number one business suite application in the cloud for growing organizations and businesses. Um, and really, they provide you with the, the capability to compete at scale with any of the big guys. That's the amazing thing to me about the cloud and all the new technology is um, the smallest companies can uh, niche down and use technology to compete at scale. It's incredibly powerful. You get real-time visibility into your customers, your invoicing, your cash flow, and your HR. Check out netsuite.com slash legends to book your free growth uh, consultation today. netsuite.com slash legends. And um, we'd always love it. If you have two seconds, give us a review wherever, wherever you enjoy podcasts. Your reviews help to drive our growth, and we've been growing uh, wonderfully here, and we really appreciate it when you share the show and, uh, and when you rate the show. All right. We would like to thank the Marketing Over Coffee podcast with John Wall and Christopher Penn. It's one of the greatest marketing podcasts out there. You heard why today. Check it out. Harper Collins Instant Classic Play Bigger, How Pirates, Dreamers, and Innovators Create and Dominate Markets. Equity Directory, connecting startups to the talent and resources they need to build a legendary business. Check out equitydirectory.com. Verve Coffee, leaders in West Coast artisan coffee and the official coffee of mm -mm -mm, legends and losers. Check them out, vervecoffee.com. Pursuingresults.com, they produce legendary podcasts and they even produce this one. Check them out. Speaking of podcasts, our good, friend, our good friends at Interview Valet, Tom Schwab's company, they're my official booking agent. They book me on podcasts, and they can book you on podcasts too. Check them out, interviewvalet.com. Our dear friends at Bell Destination Events in Maui. If you're going to Hawaii, maybe you're getting married there, and, um, or maybe you got some big strategic event, um, but if you want to make your, your uh, Maui uh, a Hawaii dream event come true, check them out, belldestinationevents.com. The Front Row Factor, the great book and podcast from our friend on episode 61, John Vroman. Check it out, the Front Row, podca the Front Row Factor podcast. <laughs> and Hal Elrod, we love Hal. He's one of the greatest authors, greatest motivators. Uh, he has amazing insights, and he has started not just, a, 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 as our friend Roman talks about, he started a whole movement with his book, The Miracle Morning. And if you haven't heard him on Legends and Losers, check out episode num number 91. But more importantly, pick up a copy of The Miracle Morning today. And our good friends at Flourishing Leadership Institute, facilitating strategic change, when some of the most uh, extraordinary companies on the planet want to navigate a massive change to make a difference in their business, they go to lead, the number two, flourish.com. Check out Flourishing Leadership Institute and our good friends at Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders. You make a donation and they make a difference in some of the most challenging areas on planet Earth. Check out doctorswithoutborders.org. All right. We need to remind you that this Oddcast is a sole property of the Legends and Losers Oddcast Network. And um, it's what you take. It's what you take when you want to get rid of your standard business boring conversation. We'd love you a little bit extra if you shared the shit out of it. We must remind you that today's information is provided to you solely for cross-functional purposes in the event of boring business conversations. Why don't you take two Legends and Losers and tweet us in the morning? Uh, this Oddcast is clearly produced in a studio that does contain nuts. However, it is never tested on GMOs. Always shower with a friend. Don't forget, the passing lane is the passing lane. Get out of the way. <laughs> Listen to Tom Petty. Support your legendary obstacle race athletes. Only fart in an elevator of three or more people. Thank you, Candy Dandy. Love you, Mom and Dad. And hey, Colin, this oddcast really ties the room together, doesn't it? Today, our deepest apologies go out to United Airlines CEO Oscar Munez. Sorry, Oscar, we just ran out of time for you. That's it. Thank you so much for investing part of your life with us. And we look forward to seeing you again soon on another episode of Legends and Losers.